good evening very warm welcome to all of you to the third episode of pearls of wisdom which is a new innovative program of ceylon college of physicians for the year 2022 i would like to uh, invite professor arusha disanayaka to give a brief introduction of this program uh, and we welcome you all as a president uh, very warm welcome to all of you Um, my name is Arosh Adisana. I am the president of the Ceylon College of Physicians. Uh, welcome to this segment of the Pearls of Clinical Wisdom program. And uh, as always, I just take a minute of your time to explain why we are doing this. Now, at the very outset, we had pledged to the membership that we'd like to learn from everybody. So we are learning from our peers through uh, different. Uh, specialty update programs we are learning from the outstation physicians physicians who work in small hospitals who work in limited resource settings and how and what we can learn from them we are learning from overseas experts in our cutting edge series we have the best in the be best of the world who oh, speak on that then of course this is a very special segment where we look up to our esteemed senior colleagues who have seen it all during their careers and then they are imparting their pearls of wisdom that may be some patients that they saw maybe how they managed problems in their times maybe how they built up certain services maybe how their perspectives of life changed so that you know we don't have to discover some of these things on our own but we can be guided by the expert uh, by their experiences and build up our own lives to be that much better and then we've had two fabulous lectures in the past uh, uh, by professor saman gunatilaka and professor anula uh, dr anula vijay sundara who are both past presidents of the ccp then of course we have invited somebody who is a little out of our physician community in terms of adult physicians but Uh, professor narada varna surya is going to be today's speaker though he is a pediatrician and as we all know uh, pediatricians were very much part of the ceylon college of physicians in the in the past and even after the establishment of their own independent vibrant college the ccp has always reserved even on the council a place for the representative from the college of pediatricians and pediatricians are most warmly welcome to obtain membership and subsequently fellowship with ceylon college of physicians so professor narada varna surya though he is technically not a physician physician he is very much part of us and of course he has been a teacher for many of us and he has been he has guided and molded so many of us in our lives but for a more formal introduction i will ask my friend and colleague dr barana millavitana who is the lead ccp lead for the pearls of wisdom program to introduce professor varna surya as well as then of course to conduct this lecture and then uh, if you all have any questions we can discuss that in the q and a section and varna will take over the program from now on so thank you very much a warm welcome to this audience thank you very much for joining us and being part of part of the ccp family over to you varna uh, thank you very much and uh, so the today uh, we are going to listen to professor narada varna surya who does not need introduction to this forum is well known figure in our medical fraternity just as a formality i would like to say a couple of things about sir he is a senior professor of pediatrics currently at kotalawal defense university and he was a emeritus professor of uh, sri jayawardenepura university and he is as though he is a pediatrician he is a fellow of ceylon ceylon college of physicians for more than 32 years and he was a past president of ceylon uh, college of pediatricians and today he is going to talk us on reminiscences of a young physician in 1970s and so so we will start the webinar and if you have any questions please type in q and a a section not in the chat so we will or any comments and at the end we will have a time for q and a i cordially invite sir uh, to start his talk 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Arosha and uh, Dr. Barana for having invited me to this very prestigious series of lectures which you have commenced. I have been watching with very great interest the numerous endeavors that Arosha has taken during his year to make uh, the continuing professional development of the physicians and I'm sorry, something happened and my screen went off. Uh, continuing uh, education of the physicians. So uh, I'm in fact very honored that I was invited. So what I intend to do during the next 45 minutes is to reminisce about my experience in the early part of my professional career, which was in the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. Uh, I, uh, five years after graduation, I joined as a lecturer to the faculty in 1973. And a year later, I proceeded to the United Kingdom for postgraduate studies. And uh, I was very eager to come back and did not ask for extensions or anything like that. And uh, two years and three months after, I came back uh, as a senior lecturer to the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo in January 1977. And I, I uh, left the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo in 1989. So really this lecture is mostly about my experience during that 12 years and maybe the few years prior to that when I was in the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. Uh, uh, it will be like a bird's eye view of certain things which I considered important during that period. Uh, it will obviously not be able to reflect all my experiences. So, and I have already delivered two lectures, the EM uh, Vijay Rama, endowment lecture and the keynote address of the 50th anniversary sessions of the Nutrition Society. In both those also, I did a little bit of uh, reflection and reminiscing about my career. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlap with what I have done, but here I'll be having some new aspects also. So to proceed with uh, uh, the lecture, I will now start sharing my slides. Right. So as I said, I came back to uh, Sri Lanka in January uh, 1977. Now, uh, just prior to my coming back, this was at the British Pediatric Association annual sessions in York a uh, few months before my return. And here I am with Dr. Mike Parkin, who was the reader in pediatrics at the Royal Victoria Infirmary. And uh, I had worked with him as a registrar in the special clinic for growth disorders. In those days, uh, the especially growth hormone was only the human variety available. It was very scarce. And uh, the clinic was strictly regulated uh, through the Medical Research Council. And I had experience working in that clinic. But I, I never envisaged that I would have the facility to use that knowledge when I came back. Although I was very interested in the social aspects of growth disorders, so I brought all along with me. Uh, I'm sorry for the poor quality of this slide what's called the Oxford height screening wall chart. I brought in fact two of these, uh, which is used in the school medical inspections in, uh, in, in UK, which was used at that time. You can clearly see the blue area, which is the normal range and the pink area, which is minus two SD and the red area, which is minus three SD. So straight away, the school medical nurses could identify ones which needed referral to a growth clinic. So I brought some along with me, but it's only when one, my colleague in the medicine department, uh, Dr. Ananda Nimula Surya, senior lecturer, along with Mr. Ananda Samarasinghe, who was a, a, a pharmaceutical executive, uh, they came up with this plan to work with Nordis in order to export our pituitaries and get human pituitary hormone in return. So that's how the endocrine society was born. And uh, this is well described in this article, which appeared in the Sunday Times. Now, so because of this intervention, I was also a council member and took over from Ananda when he went to the United States as secretary. Uh, we were having growth hormone, which was a very precious commodity to treat uh, uh, short children, uh, children with growth hormone deficiency. But unfortunately, uh, we, uh, and, and so we publicized this fact by various means. This was one of the articles we published at that time. And we, uh, Professor Carlo Fonseca was the president of our society, and we uh, established a national clinic for growth disorders in the physiology department in the Karamo Medical Faculty. 
So I had uh, brought along with me all the anthropometric charts, you know, the height charts, the height velocity charts, mid parental charts, all these were available with me. Uh, of course, at that time, there were no national charts and there were no WHO charts either. So we were using what are called the Tanner Weiss out standards. And uh, so we did a clinic, you know, we advertised and thousands wrote in and they came in and uh, we saw about 10 at each new clinic and uh, provided growth hormone to those. You know, we, we had to develop certain criteria for diagnosis of growth hormone because the growth hormone assay was not available. Uh, but in discussion with Mike Parkin, I developed certain criteria and we did treat quite a few children with growth hormone deficiency. So this was, uh, uh, you know, sort of intermediate data from our clinic, which I presented to the College of uh, then the Sri Lanka Pediatric Association. As you can see, the number undiagnosed is very high because this is sort of pending during the mid of the clinic, but you can have a rough idea of what we see. In fact, we had a lot which did not merit investigation because these were self-referrals, but as you can see, constitutional delay was a top diagnosis, especially among the boys, familial short stature. We had about 22 growth hormone deficiencies, hypothyroidism, in 25, Turner syndrome among the girls. Then about 36 were short limbed autism, and then other systemic diseases and syndromes. And pan hypopituitarism, this is of course diagnosed when they had their pituitary excise due to surgery, either due to craniopharyngioma, and we had about 11 of those in our cohort. So this data was, in fact, uh, uh, subsequently I, I did an oration for the Northwestern chapter of the. College of GPs on the epidemiology and clinical aspects of short stature. So I'm, I'm going through rapidly about certain experiences. So I thought I will start with, because everybody wants to know what the clinical things you picked up abroad, how you try to come, came, uh, implement it here. So this is one example. Of course, the second, uh, and, and then uh, luckily when, when we were in this clinic, uh, one of the most disappointing things in our findings was that although we had a large number of children with growth hormone deficiency, a very few responded well to treatment because most of them came to us very late, very close to their fusion. Uh, you know, their bone age was too advanced for them to. So when Tara Dimel, who was a registrar in our unit at the Lady Ridgeway, later became a lecturer in physiology, uh, discussed with me the possibility of uh, MD. I suggested to her a study of short stature in a community of Sri Lankan children. And she gladly accepted this offer and myself under the supervision of Professor Carlo and myself, she did this study and uh, produced the MD. This is the, uh, you know, where she studied 16,000 school children, uh, primary school children and screened them for all the causes of short stature. Mike Parkin was the external examiner and he was extremely pleased with the thesis. And uh, the, some of the results were published in the Ceylon Medical Journal. This was the article about the prevalence of growth hormone deficiency. We found a very high prevalence of growth hormone deficiency comparatively. And Mike Parkin wondered whether it is due to chronic energy protein malnutrition and psychosocial deprivation uh, being a factor. So this uh, has still not been really fully elucidated. So now the next aspect, clinical aspect that I was involved in. Uh, you know, uh, I listened very carefully to Dr. Anula Vijay Sundara's lecture, which was the previous lecture. Now, she was very fortunate in that she would go to a new unit in a periphery and start the unit. She was in charge of all. Now, in my case, uh, uh, certain circumstances of my life uh, led me to an academic pathway. I, I entered the academia at a very young age of uh, my life. So, in a sense, my Friends say that I have spent my early professional life almost uh, within walking distance of the clock, uh, clock tower. Uh, that is true. So this is one serious regret in my professional life. I wish I had a stint in an outstation either as a specialist or before I inter specialized, but that was not to be. But I made good of what I had. So when I came back, uh, you know, those days, there were very few senior lecturers in academic departments, at the most two or three. And their roles were not clearly defined, unlike now. Of course, uh, the, 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 the ward really belonged to the cadre professor, and we practiced as specialists 
uh, pediatricians or physicians in those units at the day by the grace of the CADA professor. So, so we were given certain responsibilities. Of course, the general on calls, we did mostly, the three of us did that. Uh, that means we looked after all the acute problems in the unit. But especially during, uh, uh, during, the, during the mornings, uh, the area that Professor Priyani entrusted to me was the malnutrition section and the diarrhea section. I was extremely happy with this because it coincided with my real interest, which was in social pediatrics. So I really uh, immersed myself uh, into making myself knowledgeable about these subjects. And, and unfortunately for the country, but in a way, fortunately for me, uh, in the sense, we experienced the most severe exacerbation of malnutrition in the 70s. And there were several factors. Uh, uh, one was the structural adjustments imposed by the World Bank. Uh, I mean, sounds a little rings a bit to this thing. The other was the sudden abrupt cessation of uh, aid agency, which was expelled for political reasons uh, from the Colombo municipality. So we really saw at the peak of this epidemic, we were seeing in our unit, uh, which uh, was considered the malnutrition ward, something like 150 cases of severe acute decompensated uh, energy protein malnutrition. One fifth of them were kosher cause, the others were mainly marasmus. And all of them were associated with multiple infections and multiple helminthiasis. Uh, they, they had other deficiencies like vitamin A deficiency and anemia, right? They were very commonly associated. And it was a condition with a very high case fatality, almost 10%. And uh, one severe disability we had at that time was we did not have any broad spectrum anti-helminthics. Mebendazole, which was the breakthrough drug, was in fact trialed in our unit later on but it was not available at the time that I was talking about. Uh, and also there were no guidelines on how to manage these children till the end of 1976, when the WHO came up with the mimeograph document. So we had to do it on our own. And these are the kind of, these are actually from Ward 1. Uh, this child, the walking skeleton, the classical marasmus, and this is a moderate energy protein malnutrition. And uh, we used to see keratomalacia, spots. They were very common. And before, this was pre-salt iodization. So there was endemic goiter and we saw endemic cretinism. Of course, these two conditions are now very rare and we hardly see them. But we used to see them frequently at that time. So now in managing these, these were the main principles. Now there are manuals by the WHO and there's, there are very recent manuals. The main principles remain the same. All of them used to be dehydrated. We had to correct dehydration. Fortunately, by that time we had ORS. All of them had multiple infections for which we had to screen and treat them. Uh, then we had to give them intention, intensive nutrition therapy, especially the kosher cause were anorexic. They needed nasogastric feeds, right? Okay, and so we had to develop some formulae. We did not have ready to use therapeutic food like what we have now to use. So we used to think called the kosher core mixture, right? Kosher core mixture, which was skim milk, sucrose, coconut oil with added micronutrients and this thing. So then of course, uh, we could never keep them in the ward for the full period to get the weight for height. So there was an initial period in the malnutrition ward at Lady Ridgeway. And then we had a nutrition current medicine home at Talagolda. And as a, as a registrar, as well as a convalescent, I used to go there and see the children in the convalescent home. So they were sent for rehabilitation where they were kept for another eight weeks or so. So we had to correct all the other deficiencies like the vitamin deficiencies and the anemia during this period. And the major killer for these children was hypothermia, right? Uh, like newborns and preterms, they are highly susceptible to hypothermia. So we took all actions to prevent hypothermic deaths. Then, of course, when they recover, they had not only been deprived of food, they had been deprived of love and affection. So they craved for love and affection. So we had to, we had a play therapy unit. We had a we had a full-time teacher or a play therapist, which they, and then unlike in other diseases where when you diagnose and discharge, you get them to your clinic to follow up, we knew that it was totally unrealistic for these children. So we liaised with the community. And the follow-up was arranged with the community and they rarely came back to us 
uh, unless they relapsed, which was uncommon, right? So these are the manual which the WHO later developed. Now having, uh, now this is just to see, so we were involved in, you know, as, as physicians or clinicians, there were three areas we were expected to be involved in. One is the clinical services, which I'm discussing. Then of course, as a senior lecturer, our main role was in teaching, which I will shortly discuss. Of course, along with teaching, if you had to be a real scholar, you had to be involved in generation of new knowledge or some research. So we were involved in various aspects of research. We don't have time to discuss all this. Now, this is, uh, this is a really worrying chart. Can you see this? Uh, when the units were set up, 1951, the case fatality rate in the unit, almost one in five children were, uh, you know, it was 24. 4% case fatality, right? And you can see, as you know, this is 1967 when, when I was in the final year, when Professor Piani took over. Then 73, can you see? And now how the case fatality dropped with all these interventions that we have gone through during this period, right? Okay. So I think that's all I'm going to talk about clinical aspects of my work. Now I will focus on my real interest, which is teaching. Now this is, uh, uh, you know, the professor of medicine at Leiden, Francisco Labo La Silvius, whom you are quite familiar with, especially neurologists will be familiar with him. He was the professor of medicine at Leiden, a very famous European university. And in the New England Journal of Medicine, I read this, I think it was after I had come back as a senior lecturer. And when I read it, it really stuck a chord in my mind. My method hitherto unknown here and possibly anywhere else is to lead my students by the hand to the practice of medicine, taking them every day to see patients in the public hospital that they may hear the patient's symptoms and see their physical findings. Then I question the students as to why they have noted what they have noted in these patients and about their thoughts and perceptions regarding the causes of the illnesses and the principles of treatment. Now, this was said in 1664. In 1977, I realized this was exactly what I was doing. And even today, this is exactly what I'm doing. I did this even uh, this morning, right? Okay. So this is what we do as a clinical senior lecturer. This is what any clinical teacher does, but in his own way. Now, the other thing, uh, I had always had a pension for teaching. Uh, I, in fact, after my A-level, instead of staying on in college for further three months, I went to uh, Ananda Sastrale and taught science uh, in, the, in the upper school. Uh, so I loved teaching. And uh, this was another quotation which really uh, caught my mind, which I really believe in. No man, no man can be a good teacher unless he has feelings of warm affection towards his pupils and a genuine desire to impart to them, I think this is the key phrase, what he believes to be of value. What he believes to be of value. I think Arosha, you and your colleagues, that is exactly what you are doing imparting to others what you think is of value. So another fortunate thing happened to me after I came, the medical education unit had been just set up at Peradeniya, the WHO regional center. And Professor Kote told me, uh, would you like to go for this course? I jumped at it. And I was so happy because when I went there, it was a two week course in educational science. This is one of the, the precious certificate I got from it. It was such an experience because the other participants came from all. The principal of the school of nursing was there. The principal of the school of physiotherapy was there. Uh, senior tutors from the National Institute of Health Sciences were there. Various, and there were even engineering people who joined in like Professor Lakshman Jayatilakar, who went on to become a vice chancellor and the chairman of the National Education Commission. He was also uh, there as uh, one of the resource persons along with uh, Professor Vargunam and uh, Dr. Pali Tabegon, etc. I really benefited from this and this affected my entire outlook to medical education and to teaching. 
now coming to the area of my real interest that is social pediatrics uh, although in fact I, uh, you know i i was awarded a commonwealth call and professor priyani wanted me to go and do neurology i told her no madam if i take this i will go and do social pediatrics and uh, that was because uh, this is a picture in 1967 one of the two guys in that background there is myself the one in the front is sg vikram singh my colleague i am behind him you can just see my wristwatch and the arm this is in the house of a ctb bus driver which we were allocated as the social pediatric family attachment you know this was started by professor piani so his and earl fonseca and we were the first batch that was exposed to it. and we were given the wednesdays off to go and visit these families so i love this program i love this program the person in the foreground is professor Fre actually he is, he was a reader uh, dr fred miller reader in pediatrics in social pediatrics at the university of newcastle upon tyne newcastle upon tyne is the center for social medicine and social pediatrics even in the uk they are the ones who did what is called the thousand family study which was the first cohort study where a baby from birth to 21 years was followed up looking at all the social determinants that affected his health and nutrition and uh, so he was the coordinator of that study and he came as a who consultant and visited our social pediatric program and he met me he gave me his card and said if you come to united kingdom uh, come and visit us so i did much more than that uh, i went to the unit where he was by the time i went he had retired but he continued to be a mentor to me during my stay in newcastle upon tyne uh, in social medicine and social pediatrics so this is uh i i worked for a year in the public health department by choice after being a registrar in pediatrics i didn't want to jump into clinical pediatrics straight away i i voluntarily uh, did one year as a lecturer in public health and worked in the kote pitakote health area and this is a slide from that period the, one of the public health nurses and the midwives that was their nice uniform then much better than the present one uh, right sorry right okay uh, now this is me later as a professor at uh, jayawadanapura also doing the same social pediatric program for my students going to the house uh, looking at the background of the uh, the children and the family it was not merely the children we looked at the entire family and uh, we had seminars to discuss our experiences later this is what happened in colombo also so uh, now it's it was a fascinating program i loved it i i loved i never missed the wednesday i went and and i can still vividly remember some of the students who did excelled in that program uh, i don't generally mention names but i will mention one i still remember saroj jaisingh i still remember saroj jaisingh and the family that he visited and how excellently he did and even his wife although not in the same batch damani i still remember damani how she started rehabilitating a drug addict as a finally a medical student in the social pediatric program so there were so many aspects that you could learn in this social pediatric program but the most important thing we learned were the social determinants of health which became very famous 30 years later for the who but long before that we in the faculty of medicine were teaching the social determinants of health and pediatrics through this program now very briefly i will i i don't have time to go into all my involvements but i would like to say one thing that is introduction of family medicine into the medical program i had some role in in that because uh, when the college of general practitioners first wrote to the colombo medical faculty suggesting an attachment with the general practitioner as a part of undergraduate training it was professor kotte go to summon me because i was the secretary of a faculty committee called the committee for family health which was actually to handle the unfpa money but he called me and said narada this letter has come 
So he appointed, I think it was a very distinguished panel, Professor Lionel, Professor Kodagoda, uh, Dr. Chami Sinathambi, uh, and uh, who else? Uh, Chami Sinathambi and uh, two others, I can't remember now. I was the convener and the secretary. So we discussed uh, the need for this and we actually recommended a one week attachment with a chosen GP. Uh, but unfortunately, the faculty board shot it down. Some of the senior clinical teachers said there aren't enough GPs with adequate academic background to be teachers in a university. So on that ground, they shot it down. But of course, it resurfaced for several years later. And I really pressure this letter uh, because it's a letter from the College of GPs thanking the president, thanks especially Dr. Narada Vatnasurya, and Professor S.R. Kotegoda and all those in the family, uh, all those of the family faculty of medicine who uh, supported the course of general practice in the undergraduate curriculum. I must say, uh, I really value uh, that I was able to help in that. And I have been an amicus curie for family medicine right through my uh, academic life and helped to set these departments up in two other universities, Jayawadhanapura and the KDU. Then that led me uh, to the uh, to the postgraduate. You see, the postgraduate institute was reconstituted under Dr. Cabral's directorate in 1981. So uh, I was the first secretary of the board of study in pediatrics, but I was also a nominee to the board of study in family medicine. I was one of the two clinicians. The other five were nominees from the College of General Practitioners. So I actively participated in developing the, the, the first pro prospectus of the PGIN, 1981. So uh, without wanting to boast, I can say the first prospectus for MD was developed by the Board of Study in Pediatrics. And of course, it was developed by the board. But as secretary, I was the one who really drafted it and typed it and handed it over to Dr. Cabral. And I, I think our, our prospectus served as a template even to much more senior boards, including medicine. And because there were great similarities between what we had written down in pediatrics to all the other programs. But the DFM was quite different because DFM was for general practice. So I played an active role in all of these and an active role in delivering these programs. So in fact, I was the first postgraduate tutor for the board of study in pediatrics and arranged the the concomitant training program for the clinical trainings, right? Okay. So these are, so uh, these were things I really, you know, I, I consider this period in my life, one of the most productive and the most satisfying periods, right? And I was able to help it. So due to lack of time, I will not elaborate further. Uh, uh, yeah, these are the prospectus for the diploma in family medicine, which the board of study in family medicine and the uh, secretary was Dr. Hinilame. Uh, who later became the, the, he was the founder of the North Colombo Medical College, if you remember, right? The prospectus of the diploma in family medicine, which I actively contributed to. And I actively uh, participated in delivering this program, the maternal and child health module, uh, collection, compiling a MCQ uh, bank for family medicine. Then I examined in almost every aspect of this exam. Another aspect which I really enjoyed as a teacher, I told you I, I love teaching. So as a senior lecturer, uh, Professor Priyani Zoiza gave us a fairly free hand. You know, as long as we kept her informed what, what we were doing, she did not interfere. I really appreciate the leeway, the, uh, the freedom that she gave her, us as senior lecturers to do other work. I was involved in teaching nurses, nursing sisters at the post basic school, assistant medical practitioners who were being trained then in our faculty. Uh, we also gave lectures to Ayurvedic practitioners, not on therapeutics, no, uh, limited lectures on Balaruga. I was involved in the Ceylon School of Social Work, uh, which is now an institute, uh, university institute uh, down Bagatale Road, social workers. Then there was a special category at that time. Uh, which were developed in the estate called family welfare supervisors. They were like social workers within the state who coordinated the health and uh, educational aspects on the estates. So I, I, I participated in drafting this program and actively participated as a resource person for that. 
I was involved in teaching preschool teachers, especially for Sarvodhi. And we actually produced a small handbook for them during that time. Then, then I contributed to the curriculum development center of the Ministry of Education in developing the school curriculum. Uh, you know, the parts in science, in health, hygiene, and things like that. And due to that, uh, I was involved in teaching teachers, the master teachers, put it. Then I, I collaborated very much with the Ministry of Agriculture, especially the Farm Women's Agricultural Extension Program. And I was involved in training agricultural extension workers on nutrition mainly. And at that time, myself and Dulita, Dulita was the senior lecturer in community medicine. She later became the professor. Both of us were uh, invited as consultants by the Ministry of Plan Implementation uh, to develop a course on nutrition for district administrators which we developed and we delivered it ourselves with, of course, other help. Uh, we, we were uh, involved in training district officials about nutrition. Because you, you remember the nutrition had become a very, very key topic like now. So now uh, coming back to another aspect of this. Uh, so as I told you, the social determinants of health, which are described here, were not described by the WHO then. But we were all knowledgeable about that. And both within the curricula and extracurricular activities also, we were talking about social aspects of health, right? Uh, so look at these recommendations. Improve the conditions of daily life, the circumstances in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. This is from Michael Marmot's document from the WHO. Tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources the structural drivers of those conditions of daily life, globally, nationally, and locally. Measure the problem, evaluate the action. So we were doing this before this document, long before this document came to be. In fact, uh, soon after I returned, I got together with some keen students and we commenced a thing called the social study circle. Social study circle uh, in the faculty of medicine. I remember, I think, uh, uh, Ratna Priya was the first president, if I remember. And we had discussions on uh, social aspects, relating to social aspects. Our first lecturer was uh, Dr. Kumari Jayavadana, senior lecturer in sociology, right? So these were, of course, I have to uh, say that I was actively involved politically also, but I never brought party politics into the faculty. I never appeared on a political platform. But I became a member of the Lanka Samasamaja Party when I joined the medical school, right, <laughs> in 1963. And I remained as a member in that party till about 1986 when I realized that the national relevance of that party had become very, very little and I left that party. So during that time, I was a member of the Samasamaja Party like Professor Carlo Ponseca and uh, Professor Seneca Bibilo. So, uh, we, in a way, this is Kamalika Piris who uh, wrote the bibliography about medical sciences and she has written this. Within the medical profession itself, there were several adherents of the non-commercial orientation towards medicine. A significant segment of these were doctors bent towards the socialist ideology and who therefore agreed with the idea of socialist medicine. In the late Seneca Bibile, his colleague saw a socialist doctor ahead of his time. A doctor who was not commercially oriented, viewed medicine in terms of service to people and who was courageous and successful in the pursuit of medical reform in social interest. He was truly a role model for us. So, uh, so I have to, con so now, now, this was me talking on a seminar on social aspects of health to the art students. This is in the New Arts Theatre in the Colombo uh, You can see who the chairperson is. That is Carlo. He was not a professor then. He was a senior lecturer in physiology. And this is me uh, as a senior lecturer in pediatrics talking about social aspects of health, different topics, right, to art students. And this is... Uh, from a book of uh, poetry, an anthology of poetry by Shanta Hityarachi, who was a student of ours at that time, who has written quite a few books. And this particular photograph, in fact, is at one of his previous book launches. 
uh, where myself and Carlo are seated in the front row. And this is what he has written in his collection of poems. Hita Mituru Maha Aduru Tumani Me Guru Panduru. Dedena Ekwa Sandaha Sama Samajaya Kalade Mataka Eki Yugayaka Gevi Gia Sipkiri Rasaya Nata Adata Vivade Amataka Karanu Kelesada E Purane. So I'm filing in a little bit of that Purane now. So we are keeping this going. This cohort of doctors with the, I mean, they don't have to be members of a political party. People who are committed to social justice, who consider equity to be as important as quality. I think we have a very big band of such doctors. They may not be in any uh, political party, but they are. So you know, the, now this is, the social project by the uh, students of the University of Sri Javadanapur. Every year they do a social project. And what do they do in a social project? They collect money by washing cars and they build a classroom in a very, very rural school. And all these classrooms are named after Professor Sedeka Bidini. I have gone to the actual opening of several of these uh, during my tenure as Dean and Vice Chancellor. So, it goes. I think in the Colombo Medical Faculty, they formed an organization called SIRHA, Students for uh, Rational Health Action. I, I'm not sure whether it is still there. So this thing continues. I think it is still there also. Right? So now, I think uh, I have probably gone faster than uh, I should have. And so preparing to uh, finish the talk. Now, this was a quotation that I came across in a book later on in my life, a book, beautiful book called Courage to Teach by an American educationist. And, and the theme of that book is uh, the good teaching depends on the identity and the integrity of the teacher. That slogan really caught my eye. And I, I have this book with me and I have read this and I've taken the most important uh, quotation from that book. I think I'm going to read it. Good teachers possess a capacity for connectedness. They are able to weave a complex web of connections among themselves, their subjects, that means the topics, and their students, so that the students can learn to weave a world for We are adult learners. So we get them to weave a world for themselves. The methods used by these weavers vary wide lectures. Webinars like this, Socratic dialogues, laboratory experiments, field work like in the community, collaborative problem solving, creative chaos, anything, anything, anything goes. The connections made by the good teachers are held not in their methods. This is very important. I truly believe in this, but in their hearts, meaning heart in its ancient sense, as the place where intellect emotion, spirit, and will converge in the human self. I truly believe in this and in every activity of teaching, irrespective of the context, this is what I try to do. I try to get the student to meet my mind. I speak to their mind, of course, not to just adopt. I often quote the Kalama Sutra. I don't accept anything because a professor says it. But digest it, think about it, learn about it, reflect on it. That is how you learn. And that is what I have uh, kept on teaching as a teacher in the medical faculty. And uh, I thought, now there are so many descriptions of a physician in a generic term, in a generic sense. And uh, uh, so that is why I Title this physician, although I'm as Arocha said, I'm strictly a pediatrician, but I meant a physician in the general. Now, this is this is really a, I mean, this is not only Canadian. So many medical associations describe these different roles of a physician. The professional, the ethical practitioner who ensures that he's competent and has the skills necessary to practice. That is the professional. The communicator. Communicator, not merely in teaching, 
with the patients, with the public, with the administrators, a good communicator. Scholar, here they have combined both the teaching and the research role. Uh, the real word is the university lecturer is a scholar. Research does not get pr uh, priority, neither does teaching. They are both important. Teaching is really useless if you are not involved in actively seeking and generating knowledge. So the two are linked. So you have to be a scholar. Collaborator sounds funny. I think what they mean is team worker. Especially today, you have to learn the art of being a team leader. We have a tendency to think that we have to be the team leader. right? No, we don't necessarily have to be the team leader. We can be in the team. So we have to learn to be in the team. For example, when I worked in Saudi Arabia, the quality assurance committee, which reviewed deaths was chaired by a nurse with a PhD, not, not a specialist clinician. And I had absolutely no qualms in presenting my patients to that uh, committee. A team worker, health advocate. This is, I mean, uh, Professor C.C. C. Silva in his introductory lecture to us asked, what is the role of a pediatric patient? So we gave all kinds of answers, but he wanted one answer, that a pediatrician keeps a well child well. That was the answer. So that lesson he gave us has stuck with us right through. I think pediatrics has been in the forefront of the clinical disciplines in, in incorporating uh, health promotion into their ambit. That is why many pediatrics departments prefer to call them departments of child health. But I think today, especially with the NCDs, all departments, obstetrics, medicine, especially, have become health advocates. Now, I, I really mentioned, now, for example, uh, the, our, our present dean at KDU is normal. He's an interventional cardiologist. I think he's a very active member of your college. Maybe I think the editor of your journal also. But see how much of health promotion he does. I think he has published something like 10 or 11 booklets in very lucid singhalis. Uh, about obesity, about cardiovascular disease, about so many other things. So all of us learn to be health advocates, health promoters. Manager, this is, we are all involved in technical evaluation committees. Now, of course, if you go as your own boss to a, uh, the undeveloped unit, you have to be a manager, you have to develop that unit. As a senior lecturer in the university, the role that I had a manager was less, but later, of course, I had to play that role when I became a professor and a unit. But, uh, but even here, I was involved in small projects, in uh, managing projects. Then what, what is this last item, medical expert? That is, you have to have your niche, your area of expertise. At this level, we have to say, because, you know, the knowing you have to have an area where you say, I am I'm truly knowledgeable of this. I am an expert in this. Uh, I can advise others about this. Now, for me, it's nutrition and maybe even growth disorders, right? And like that, say, social pediatrics, my interest, but if, say, clinical areas, if you ask me what is my area, I would say it's nutrition and growth disorders. So I think within this period, as a senior lecturer, those days, there was no merit promotion straight away to professor that came on later. So we were not collecting points during this period. I had not maintained any records at all, but we enjoyed the work, got involved in the work, and we did the work, and the credits and the plaudits came later. The promotions came later, right? So I had no regrets about it. So I think uh, a few pictures, okay, I'm, I'm running a few pictures. Uh, medical faculty staff at the convocation, only four people are living from this picture. Uh, Rohini, uh, Seniviratna, uh, myself, Harsha, and of course, Professor Priyani, the most senior. All the others have departed. They are very, very respected teachers of the Kalamu Medical Faculty. This was after one of the MDs, the examiners at the MD again, I think you will recognize some of these people. For example, Dr. Alaric Jaisinger, you might know, were a very senior pediatrician on this end. And this one, just to show that uh, I, uh, I had a slim waist at some time or the other, uh, this was uh, at the Centenary uh, Congress uh, for the SLMA, where uh, the chap on my right 
is a medical student from Manchester, elective students. Now, I didn't have time to talk about elective students. I had plenty of elective students who came and worked with me. And many of them did research projects. And this guy did a brilliant research project uh, on uh, uh, asthma and, and the allergens. You know, he, he did skin testing as well as uh, took blood for specific IgEs. And we presented this paper at the SLMA Congress. And this is where, by the way, the person on the left is Nandini, who was my batchmate and uh, uh, professor of uh, family medicine and a vice chancellor like me of the Open University. So just this institution, I think especially during this time, it produced some outstanding graduates. They are all over the world. Uh, I think I can count one UGC chairman, at least three vice chancellors, maybe close to 30, 40, 50 professors, not only in Sri Lanka, and hundreds of consultants. But I'm also proud of the general practitioners or the general medical officers in the health department who have served our country, who have stayed here. Every one of them has done a yeoman service. So as a teacher, uh, I'm very glad that I could play at least a little role in them. Uh, this is in fact one, Rasika Jayatunga, some many of you might know. She's a consultant pediatrician at Sandwell and she's the first one to organize a fixed uh, avenue for our postgraduates to go and work in the NHS there. She established a contract system for pediatric trainees. So uh, I think I won't recite the poet. You can have a quick look at it. Uh, it's with hard work and determination, most achieved their goal. Those sports, fun and laughter also play the role, right? Okay. So, and finally, uh, I think any good teacher's heart warms when the students excel. Uh, the students outdoing is really a, is a blessing to a good teacher. So this poem, I use this in the E.M. Vijayaram oration also, I will end with this. Isarat dasayo sitiyaka saramba pe sasa rehi purudde esvahak neha adat ehe mai hitat eten hisno vedde doskiyana aya doskiyadde kudana aya buhu man pudadde gas vetedde pele hededde Dalu damadding mal tripedde. This is my wish to my colleagues, uh, to my students, and my friends. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Thank you very much, sir, for the inspirational talk given by you, sir, regarding uh, your career as a clinician as well as especially as a teacher. I think uh, our participants, some of your uh, colleagues who were with you also participated in this webinar. And uh, in the Q&A section, there's no questions. And uh, just I'll ask some questions regarding uh, the challenges you face. So as a teacher, initially, the challenges you faced uh, to establish these things, as well as when you advance in your career and you became the dean as well as the vice chancellor. That was in Jawadanapura, not in Kalambu. Yes, sir. Right. I, uh, you see, Professor Sanat Lamabha Surya was my colleague and he was senior to me. And honestly, he had a much better academic and research record than me. So he became the professor in Kalambu. So I, I actually, after a stint abroad, I came to Jawadanapura as the founder professor. Yes. So what is, what is your question? Uh, so the challenges as the teacher, as well as when you well, advance. Really, really uh, there was no challenge in the sense, uh, because uh, one, of course, unlike uh, outstation physician, we are your own boss. We had to work within the purview of our, uh, the, the Professor Piani Soiza, because she was the CADA professor, and even the clinical practice as a specialist was, at her grace, right? Okay. And, and the teaching. So only thing is, she did not really put any barriers on us. She shared the teaching equally. So for example, the group was broken up into two or three. And while she was taking one group in the morning, then half the group would join me on the malnutrition side or the diarrhea side. 
So there was no problem for clinical teaching. And then of course, uh, the on-calls were done by the senior lecturers or the, the professor. And we, so every third day we had to do on-calls. And those days it was really busy. And uh, the ward one being a university unit was a closed unit. That means we had admissions uh, all, on one day we had admissions right through 24 hours. On other days, we had admissions right through the, during the day. So we had to be available. So I used to, I did not have a car actually. I sold my car to buy my house. So I used to travel by bus, but uh, the, they used to send me an ambulance. So there was no problem. And I used to come very often for a night round. And I used to teach even the casualty, the students. So I didn't have any barriers to teaching. Of course, uh, we didn't have an office there. I, my office was my briefcase and I used to go to the senior common room in the faculty and stay during lunch and come back in the afternoon, right? Later on, we got an office, right? Uh, we didn't have all these PowerPoints and various things. Uh, you know, we use uh, the overhead projectors or the blackboard to teach. So those were, uh, I don't know whether there were constraints. Uh, within those, I think we were able to do our job. So I hope you have answered. I think now, for example, this uh, COVID and this Zoom technology is such an advancement. You know, to be honest, I think continuing professional development is occurring 100 times better now with this technology than when it was face-to-face. -face. So as things develop, new techniques develop. But during the period that you work, you learn to work within what you have and make best use of it. So I had no problems, no problems at all. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I think uh, uh, you'd like to have any comments or uh, the any questions from the audience? I think if you yeah, I would very much like comments, especially if my colleagues are there. If they comment yes, about it, uh, <laughs> I would very come welcome it. Actually, in the previous lectures, I did receive comments. The SLMA has case discussions. No, they always send you the entire comments and things which come in, uh, which is very pleasing to you. I mean, uh, I welcome negative comments also, uh, honestly, right? Of course, I would prefer positive ones, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you for joining in. Uh, it was really an honor to be as a pediatrician to be uh, invited to do this third Pearls of Wisdom lecture. Thank you, Arosha, and thank you, Barana. And I, I know Dinusha was also involved in the organization and Nalina, all of them, thank you for an excellent organization. Yes. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, give a live comment, I think can raise the hand, then our uh, IT team will unmute. No raise hands. Right, <laughs> yes. okay. So we'll, we'll yeah. just wait for yeah. you. I team. think... Uh, so on behalf of the College of Physicians, as well as for the president and the council, I would like to thank uh, Professor Nardavan Surya to give, uh, for his enlightening lecture to the young physicians as well. All of us learn a lot and we know that the difficulties you face and how you manage and it will be like a guidance to most of us. And so it's, thank you very much, sir, for your the lecture. And next, I would like to thank all the CCP staff and, and the, the pre-interns and the people who coordinate this event on behalf of Ceylon College of Physicians. Finally, uh, the Nalina is our IT uh, person, actually is always helping us for these webinars. So thank you, Nalina, for your excellent uh, coordination. Uh, Barana, I just want to mention Sir. one name which I forgot. You okay. know, I put uh, I prepared the PowerPoint for this within the matter of 48 hours. And it was Vidushini Jayasuri, the technical officer at KDU, who helped me that. I really want to acknowledge it. I omitted to do that. Yes. So Vidushini and everybody who contributed to the success of this third Pearls of Wisdom. Actually, most of us got a lot of pearls from these lectures. And thank you very much. And good night. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you.